What's going on everybody and welcome back to Comic Breakdown. In today's video we're jumping into Death to the Mutants issue number 2. As they continue on the same pattern, we have seen Death to the Mutants and all the other tie-ins. They really dive deeper into everything that is going on with the Judgment Day comic line itself. The main series that is pushing the plot forward. While stories like Death to the Mutants as well as Immortal X-Men and X-Men Red, these were all giving us the small small details, the conversations, everything that is happening while these big battles are being raged. And so this comic specifically is going to be focusing on before and after they tried to take down the progenitor, the celestial that is giving them 24 hours before their judgment is made. We will see many more people getting judgment. And we are also learning a lot more about the Hex. The Eternals that are living weapons being stashed away in Uranus's secret arsenal now being unleashed upon the world. We're going to learn that there is definitely more to the Hex than simply being a weapon. Before we get started, I have to give a shout out to Highwire554 as well as Nick Wilson. Thank you guys very much for joining the channel membership. And if any of you would like to join, much like Patreon, there are five different tiers that I have set up from a dollar to $50, loyalty badges, shout outs, members only chats, members only polls, video collaborations, having you a guest on the channel, tons and tons of perks that I have, and much more to come. So please consider hitting that join button and being a part of the channel membership. Make sure you guys are subscribed to the channel, make sure you like this video, and with that being said, let's dive into this breakdown. Alright gang, so as we jump into issue number 2 of Death to the Mutants, the story starts with a conversation with someone in London, UK, talking to somebody about poetry, about things that they love, trying to understand the world that she is living in. But we quickly learn that this individual she is talking to, it is in fact one of the Hex, the one known as Mimitar. It appears while the Hex are sitting here on the front lines trying to take down mutant kind, somehow they are also communicating with humanity, using the internet to do so. Now the Hex, they were created as weapons of last resort. Due to their enormous violent potential, they only existed locked away in armories. But they have been in existence for millions of years. Ever since Uranus's defeat 400,000 years ago, they have been locked away in this armory. They have sat here, and they have waited, and while they are very destructive in nature, some of the most violent weapons to ever be created, at least by the Eternals, there seems to be a different side to them. This is when we jump over to Lemuria, and we have a conversation between Emma Frost and Crow. What we are seeing is their alliance begin, but Emma Frost, she is a little bit skeptical, not sure if they can trust the Deviants, not sure why they're really trying to join up with them to begin with. Crow lets it be known. If his enemies believe them to be deviants, believe mutant kind to be deviation, that is enough for them to go to war. They simply won't let them stand alone. While everybody else may let deviants stand on their own, they know what it is to be persecuted, to be hunted. But there is also a little bit of self-interest in all of this. The Eternals, they need to be defeated. He knows that if Uranus is let go, if he is released from his prison like he was on on Arako. If they do that here on Earth, they might as well just be dust. In these dark times, they need powerful allegiances. Mutant Kind is one of the most powerful that you can get. And that is when we are thrown over to the battlefield. We see all the Deviants making their way through the gates. That is when we learned that Deviants can in fact walk through Krokoan gates. That their DNA is enough like Mutant Kind, it allows them access. And even the machine still questions, how much are the Deviants and Mutants really alike? Are Mutants in fact excess deviation? Maybe, maybe not. But one thing is excess deviation, and that is an excess Deviant. And this is where we see Crow and his army. They have a Deviant that has gone into excessive deviation. Using the third principle against the Eternals, they take these excess deviations, those that have turned into murderous monsters, and they start hurling them at the Hex. 
at all of the Eternals. Because of this, they cannot help themselves. The programming kicks in, and they go chasing after them. These distractions help him and his entire army be able to combat this, while all of our X-Men, our high-powered ones, our Omega levels, they are all currently headed over to try to take down the Progenitor. But as we know, the first battle of the Progenitor, it was an utter loss. It was all an illusion created by our Celestial. After this, everybody recognizes that they are going to be judged. And how people are judged, many are going to be very upset about it. After their attack on the Celestial has failed, we have Emma Frost and Crow having a conversation again. And Crow is letting Emma know that it is time we prepare. The Eternals, they are gathering their strength, they're gathering their forces, and they will strike again. And everybody needs to be prepared for what is about to come. Emma Frost finds herself a little bit distracted, a little bit upset, mad, you could even say sad, because the progenitor, it judged her. She got the thumbs down. Knowing that she probably shouldn't really care what this celestial has to say, she does feel the pain of it. If the world ends today, she would be part of the reason that it ends. For Crow, this is something that he has been feeling for such a long time. Finally, Mutant Kind is understanding how deviants have been treated this entire time. His words of wisdom is that the Celestials can go F themselves. You see, Crow has been around for the upwards of 20,000 years. For deviants, this is not normal. He is an exception of the deviant race. In fact, Deviants, they die quicker than humans do. With Crow being so old, he has seen a lot. That includes Erishim the Judge, the Celestial that came to his city when he was nothing more than a boy. This is something that he can never forget. That's when, before Crow, stands Erishim the Judge. This is, in fact, the progenitor. When he goes to make his judgment, he takes the form of something you hate, something you fear, to see how you react to it. You can say it's almost cheating to throw you off your game to see if you are truly worthy of being alive of getting that thumbs up it wants to know why did you lead your people to die on these beaches he knew if they didn't stand with powerful people that his people were going to be doomed in his mind this was a no-brainer they either stand with the powerful or they fall with the weak we all know that crow got his thumbs up but what is even more Every single Deviant got a thumbs up. All of them. And this is because many of the Deviants, they didn't even know why they were going to war to help the mutants. They followed Crow regardless. They stood in the defense of people that were about to be obliterated. And so the Progenitor gives all of them a thumbs up. For the first time in their lives, they can say that they feel loved by their God. Now, when it comes to the judgment of our Eternal, we have the Delphin brothers. They have been voted down. An experimentation gone wrong. It allowed them to multiply. As the two fight amongst each other, blaming one another, we have Druig, who is biting his nails, absolutely terrified of what his judgment will be. While he contemplates what will happen, we have the progenitor who has come to Uranus. And he lets the god know that it is simply too early for you to come and pass judgment on me. Because his work, it has truly just begun. And so the god waits. He allows time to pass for things to play out and see if they have the possibility of getting that thumbs up. As we jump over to Avengers Mountain, we have the Eternals that are currently fighting amongst one another, creating a podium to be able to speak to the progenitor. We see Icarus, he hops onto the podium and he immediately says, Death to the Eternals. He is in grief. He knows exactly what they are capable of. He knows that the Eternals are responsible for human death. That every time they get resurrected, a human is sacrificed. Saying that they have outlived their purpose. That they are death. 
that it is time the Eternals come to an end. As the three of them sit here and fight, that is when the progenitor shows his face, letting Icarus know that he is going to consider this. But now it is time to face their judgment, his creators. Now seeing their god as he is, he poses the question to all of them. Would you do it again? If you were given the chance again, would you recreate me? Would you make a god in your image? Would you allow the progenitor to come back to life? each of them giving their answers. Fastos letting them know that he would not do it. He believed that he was choosing the lesser of two evils. With all of them giving their answers, we learn that Fastos passes, Makari fails, and Ajak, she will be deferred for the time being. And Icarus will also get a little bit more time to be considered. But he does warn him, letting him know that there is an Eternal that is lying to him. We know this to be Cersei. She had lied to Icarus about telling the humans the truth about their resurrection. A secret that can't be kept for much longer. Once he learns that Cersei lied about this, we can almost guarantee he is going to go to the Avengers himself and let them know. But before our god leaves, Fastos needs to know, why does he pass but Makari fails? Giving a simple answer, letting it be known that Makari regrets, but she presses on. She has done nothing to turn back. But Fastos, he gets gave the X-Men assistance in being able to destroy him. It seems really if you stick to your principles, you might be able to pass. Now this isn't always the case because we saw Captain America who was judged poorly, but no one said that this judgment was going to be fair. The judgment just is. We also learned that our Celestial is going to be judging the machine, the one that has been watching, pretending to help but never helping at all, and the progenitor lets the machine know that not even the machine can escape judgment. That's when we jump over to the Hall of Blades. We have Cersei and Jack of Knives. Cersei has come to Jack and Knives because she wants to release somebody from prison. They want to do a jailbreak at the exclusion. And while Jack of Knives, he is a little bit hesitant on doing this. For the right price, he is more than willing to do so. Having just the right knife to be able to break into this exclusion, they head off to the cell. Now if this had been any other exclusion, because it is broken up into different sectors, this is excluded E, which is kind of like minimum security. People like Uranos, they are in excluded K. But the one behind this door, this is Star Fox. This is Cersei's plan, hoping to use his powers and ability to be able to shift the balance and save the planet. But he is someone that is seen with great suspicion, the only Eternal to ever be added to the Great Machine. Even when his brother failed, he succeeded with breaking him out of prison. Before they leave here, he does want to have a conversation with his mother. He only wants to ask a couple questions. Did he pass judgment on you? And while it did appear to her, it declined to judge her just yet. It is yet to decide her worth, even with Thanos on her tally. With Star Fox now understanding what he needs to do, he plans to balance the scale, not only for his cursed family, but for the entire world. As we begin to close out the comic, we jump back over to London, our young woman having a conversation with Mimitar. Now she doesn't know that this is in fact the Hex, that it is an Eternal that is conversating with her. But our young lady tells the Hex that the progenitor has passed judgment. Coming in the form of her grandmother, she was given the thumbs down. And she fully doesn't understand why she was judged this way. Thinking maybe, maybe it was because she procrastinated in her writing, in doing her poetry. Could this be the reason that I was judged bad? Everyone trying to make sense of why they might be the reason humanity is destroyed. Asking Mimitar if it had been judged. It says not yet but it believes that it is going to be judged for something else entirely. The truth is, Mimitar is burning people by the dozens. A million year old teenager laying down some death and destruction, all in the hopes that the progenitor will give it a thumbs up, that it did its job and it did it correctly. And that will be the end of this issue. So let me 
me know what you guys think down in the comments. Now, while this one wasn't severely action-packed, it really did give us a ton of information. We're learning more and more how this thing is starting to judge. While we don't really have a full grasp on how it judges, it really seems that if you stick to your principles, if you die by your word, there is a chance that you might be able to get that thumbs up. But they also factor in your failures, your inability to do what you set out to do. As we saw with Captain America, but the other side of that coin, we have Crow. Being a very cynical man, some would even call him a supervillain. But at the end of the day, he does what he has to do for his people, for all deviants. It was very nice to see Emma Frost not be at the top of her game. You know, she's been a boss lady through most of the X-Men comics. Never faltering, never wavering. But when the progenitor came to her and judged her poorly, this really did affect her. Even if it were for a small moment, it's nice to see Emma Frost having a little bit of vulnerability with none other than Crow. I mean, this man believes that everybody is hitting on him and he really does get around. Not saying that they have that type of relationship, but Crow is a very flirtatious individual. And then we have Icarus. Icarus has been on the verge of breaking for a minute, even lashing out at his other Eternals. It is only a matter of time before he goes to find Cersei, to find out the truth. And then of course we got a little more of Star Fox, believing that he really can turn the tide of this judgment. We're gonna see in the Immortal X-Men, he is gonna be striking a deal, and that's where Sebastian Shaw is going to come into play. So let me know your thoughts, let me know your theories. If you would like to get caught up on everything happening with Judgment Day, be sure to check out the link in my description as well as the top of this video. It is going to get you completely caught up on everything going on with this event. If you would like to support the channel, please do me a favor, consider joining the channel membership. Much like Patreon, it is going to let you have tons of perks, having tiers from $1 to $50, tons of benefits coming with it. Not not only that, it goes to helping our channel in tremendous ways. Now, if you're unable to do that, please do me a favor, subscribe to the channel, like this video, hit that notification bell, and with that being said, until the next breakdown.